Good morning, my friends. Grim here, I hope you're all doing well, and hey, for those of you who are magic-only viewers, it has been a while, I'm happy to see you again. Thank you so much for tuning in as I cover Lion Sash, a brand new card from Kamigawa Neon Dynasty. Now, just to get it out of the way, yes, I am still retired from Magic the Gathering. I have not played a single game in any form since Donation League 100, and that's mostly because I'm still just as busy as ever. Work takes up a very significant chunk of any given day. I'm very happy to prioritize my family through the rest of my free time, mostly such as it is. With the remaining free time I have, I'm trying to stay healthy, trying to push a couple other projects forward a little bit, and also I'm trying to relax and have fun with Skyrim. If you haven't checked out my Skyrim content, please do. It's a vibe. It's really, really fun. We have a great time there. However, I am still in the loop with magic, thanks to my friends and the lovely Discord that I run. I read every single post there, and I still really enjoy thinking about the game, analyzing the game, and I think I'm still relatively hip to what's going on, thanks to reading all of that great content. And... To that end, I'm here to analyze Lion Sash, partially because I want to, and partially because when I announced my semi-retirement from Magic, the number one overwhelming thing that people wanted me to keep doing, even if I wasn't playing as much or a, at all anymore, is the Will It Rock video. So in this case, we're looking at Lion Sash in the context of black-white mid-range, specifically a Stoneforge Mystic deck. Is it dead? Lion Sash, basically a tutorable white scavenging ooze with some very important pros and cons to dissect. I think it is dead. I think it's a great card that's going to see play across a variety of decks and a variety of formats while not being seen maybe in overwhelming numbers in any of those, nor warping any format that I can think of. So in other words, I think it's exciting, interesting, and well-designed. It inspired me to make this video. Thank you so much for watching, thanks to all patrons, and let's get into it. For one generic and one white mana, you can cast yourself an artifact, creature, equipment, cat. Quite the type line called Lion Sash. And the first thing to note there, it's an artifact and a creature, pros and cons to that multiple typing, and it's an equipment so it can be tutored for with Stoneforge Mystic. If you're one of the few the proud that play Cat Tribal, that type might be relevant to you as well. But that's quite the type line, and then it's quite the text box as well. We have one white mana activated ability, exile target card from a graveyard. If it was a permanent card, put a plus one plus one counter on Lion Sash. Second line reads, equipped creature gets plus one plus one for each plus one plus one counter on Lion Sash. And those two t lines of text might be a little bit incongruent together until you read the final one. It's a new ability, reconfigure for two, which reads attach to target creature you control or unattach from a creature. Reconfigure only as a sorcery. While attached, this isn't a creature. Finally, the power and toughness is 1-1. One, one. So that's what the card does. There's a lot to break down there. We're going to get into it. Just my quick overview. I think the card, like I said, is strong across multiple formats. We're focusing, of course, as always, on modern on this channel. And I think just... I have little experience with DNT, but I think it'd be good there. I have no experience with Blue White Stoneblade. I think it'd be good there. However, I do have a lot of experience with Black Based Midrange. Obviously, we're thinking of Dead Guy Ale here, and I think this is going to be a good fit there. We have seen the role time and time again in midrange decks of Mana Sinks. When you're taking the game long, when you're disrupting the opponent, a Mana Sink is very useful because you pay a small cost up front. In this case, it costs two, and that is something that you can do as part of curving out, and it's something that you can repeatedly sink mana into as the game goes longer, if it's the optimal play, or if you have nothing better to do. And so structurally, and in terms of its abilities and synergies, I do think it's a good fit in Dead Guy Ale, but the obvious comparison is to our old veteran stalwart scavenging ooze, and we've got to do the side-by-side -side comparison in order to really see how good Lion Sash can be.
Alright guys, so Scooze has basically only the first text of Lion Sash, and even those are slightly different. So we're going to focus in on comparing Scooze's activated ability to the Sash's activated ability, and even that is a little bit murky because both are color intensive, both are one activation, aka one mana, in order to exile one target card from a graveyard, and they can exile anything from any graveyard. There's no restriction on that. But Scooze only grows from creatures, whereas Lion Sash grows from any permanent. Scooze gains life, Lion Sash does not gain life. So that's the first distinction to really understand. And with that established, let's talk about the cons. Let's give you the bad news first. With Lion Sash, you don't gain that life, and that's a pretty big deal. I have a lot of nostalgia for those back to the wall moments where a human's deck or a burn deck kind of blitzkriegs you and you're just barely keeping up with them and then maybe turn four or so, down comes a scooze, you eat a couple things that you've killed, it's a four four, you stabilize your life total, and all of a sudden the script is totally flipped on the opponent and you've got time to top deck and maybe the game goes long and you just kind of slowly choke them out with a scooze. It's a very, very mid-rangey way to win a game and without that life gain ironically enough the white card not having life gain that means that lion sash can't really do that for you however the other cons are not limited to just the lack of life gain lion sash of course compared to the big thick scoos is a little bit skinny we've got it just a base one one and that's pretty bad especially when you're playing it on curve you can be much more vulnerable to ping effects and just less useful as a blocker along the ground especially if you're choked on mana you were playing planning on maybe trading off the scoos for a goblin guide to continue that type of example when you're stuck on two mana you can't do stuff like that with lion sash and it's also an artifact in the type line, that is a pro as well as a con, depending on the shell, but certainly it can be a con insofar as it turns on opposing artifact removal. And artifact removal tends to just say, destroy target artifact, you know, it's not necessarily damage based most of the time, whereas Scooze, a lot of creature removal is more likely to be damage based. Scooze is only vulnerable to creature removal, also able to outsize certain aspects of or certain um examples of creature removal lion sash just opens you up to straight up kill spells in a way that scoos would never be vulnerable to finally the other major pro to lion sash it's a lot less punnable you can't say you're cruising for a scoozing you can't say i'm scoozing and boozing or any other number of charming phrases to your irritated opponent so psychological advantage gotta go to the scoos So based on all that, you might be tempted to start thinking that Lion Sash is just kind of a worse scooze. Maybe it's nice because it's in white for decks that didn't have access to green, but is that as far as it goes? Not even close. So that artifact type line, let's start there for the pros. Not necessarily in Dead Guy Ale most of the time, but in other shells, certainly that can be a bonus. Critical mass of artifacts being a recurring element in synergy across modern that waxes and wanes with the meta, but is never truly dead. The other thing to mention with Lion Sash that's more relevant to our interests in Dead Guy Ale is that it grows off of all permanents, not just creatures. Again, you're missing out on that life gain, but you're growing with any permanent. In mid-range decks, of course, putting all kinds of permanents in the graveyard with discard spells, with removal, etc. And Specifically, the best example of this is with Fetchlands. If you are anywhere near a modern player, you've seen Fetchlands aplenty filling up the bins. Lion Sash can go ahead and gobble those up just to send a message to the opponent to get huge. If the OP's on Renin 6 or some other strategy that cares about lands in the graveyard, you can go ahead and hose that while growing as well. Whereas with Scoos, you're like, okay, do I disrupt? Or do I spend my mana maybe playing a Tarmogoyf or something, putting more power onto the field? With Lion Sash, you kind of get to do both under circumstances like that.
the next major pro in favor of Lion Sash, my friends, is this reconfigurability. It's kind of a weird one to fully comprehend, but think of it this way. It is giving you tactical flexibility. So if you have some kind of a creature that you can attach it to with evasion, you're generating an evasive attacker that you would not otherwise have access to that is much, much bigger than it would otherwise have any right to be. You also, if you have any kind of on-hit procs, of course, we're thinking about a Stoneforge Mystic Shell, you can kind of load one creature up, maybe that creature has protection, and then the Lion Sash gives it even more PNT than it would otherwise have, allowing you to close out the game quicker. Now, all of that is admittedly a little bit win more, but one way in which Reconfigure is flexible without being win more is that it gives you insurance against board wipes. So if you've got the age-old question, do I play out into the verdict or do I hold it back? Well, with Lion Sash, you get to play it out, you get to attach it, and then you're putting more power and toughness on the board, thus more pressure on the control player without committing too many cards in to the Supreme Verdict or otherwise into a board wipe that you might fear. On top of that, in the event that you do force a board wipe thanks to the pressure of Lion Sash, being reconfigured, you immediately regain tempo. So the Supreme Verdict resolves, your creatures all die, Lion Sash unattaches, and then is a creature on the field. So next turn, you don't even need to reinvest the mana into it, it's just already there. Very, very nice in tactical regards, especially against sweeper effects. And finally, my friends, the big, gigantic checkmark in the pro column in favor of Lion Sash is the fact that it's tutorable with an already very powerful card, already a core component of Dead Gael in the form of Stoneforge Mystic. So keep in mind that it's roughly comparable to Scooze, which has been very, very decent for a long time now, fallen off a little bit, but still a respectable inclusion. Then consider all the other pros I just mentioned that Lion Sash brings to the table over Skews, and then consider this one. Then consider SFM tutoring up Lion Sash. This is even stronger than you think it is, because number one, if you want that Skews type of effect in your deck, and you're not playing any kind of a, you know, fringe traverse strategy, for example, you're probably playing multiple scooses, at least two, sometimes three in the past. And we all know, we've all been there, you're drawing multiple scooses, even when they're decent, they're kind of redundant, except in the face of removal. And when they're bad, they're grizzly bears. If you're against big mana or some other deck that you have to race and doesn't care about their graveyard, you're literally just casting a grizzly bear. But with Stoneforge Mystic, you can have only one copy of your Scoos, in this case of your Lion Sash, and actually see it a lot more often than even three copies of Scoos in a non-tutoring shell. So obviously, the ability to tutor up Grave Hate while generating card advantage, remember Stoneforge Mystic herself, is almost always a two for one. That, my friends, is very, very useful. On top of that, it is a better tutor target lots of the time in the face of removal than other things would be because you tutor up a Sword of Fire and Ice or a Batter Skull, your Stoneforge Mystic eats a Lightning Bolt, and then that card is rotting in hand. If you have a chance to hard cast it, it's still not doing anything without any other kind of support, but Lion Sash is low curve and operates well on its own, thus basically less clunky most of the time, although with a lower ceiling admittedly as well, than other things like Batter Skull, Cauldra Complete, or the powerful parts of the Sword Cycle. The final point I'll mention here to really drive home the sale, as far as this going in SFM decks, is that this rewards the ratios of Stoneforge Mystic to equipment that I already think are optimal. I'm talking about 4 Mystic to 3 equipment if she's a core part of your deck, or 3 Mystic to 2 equipment if it's more of a splash. I could even say that Lion Sash could be the fourth equipment in some shells, although I'd be willing to say maybe that's a little bit ambitious after some testing if I find it too clunky. But again, the characteristics I mentioned a moment ago about Lion Sash leads me to believe that 
that ratio is not unreasonable. What I really have never liked doing is playing four Stone Forge Mystic with only two equipment, because we're a mid-range deck, we need that card advantage, we can't afford the bad top decks if you're going long, you're going to get there where you've already drawn two SFM, you draw the third and you've got nothing to tutor. And that's even assuming you're not unlucky enough to draw naturally or open with your seven having one of the equipment already in hand. So the ratio of higher numbers of equipment relative to SFM behooves us greatly, in my opinion, in terms of making Stoneforge Mystic more powerful and in terms of following the mid-range strategy as a whole. Lion Sash being flexible, being able to operate independently, and not being a dead draw even when you're drawing it naturally without an SFM, all of those things really serve to make the overall shell more coherent, more consistent, and I hope more powerful. Well, there you go, my friends. Did you miss my 20 minute long rambles about a card that most people would glance at and say, yeah, I could play it, that seems decent, I'll try it. Well, we gotta break it down in excruciating detail for you. I hope you enjoyed that. Overall, I love the card. I think it's very cool. Maybe not quite as cool as my beloved Scoos, right? But I do think it's probably a little bit better, a little bit suited to the task in 2022 between all of the various upsides that I mentioned, although far from strictly better, even when you set aside the different color availability to different decks. Either way, it's very pleasing to see this card because it will likely be a staple across multiple formats, but with a very small presence. Not power crept to hell and back, not warping anything, just a very interesting card that rewards certain strategies. Um, coolness factor is, is pretty decent too, obviously we don't have a high res image here, but I like the, the basic art well enough, I think it's relatively cool. We've also got a full art for those inclined. And then a promo for those who want a little bit of a different vibe. I think I prefer the original art, but but that, as always, is up to you. Thank you so much for watching, guys. Again, I hope you enjoyed it. And as always, I want to know what you think. Leave your thoughts below, anything you'd like to add to my breakdown here. Any hot takes, that's what the comments are for. Thanks again for watching. Thanks again big time to all patrons. And I'll talk to you guys soon. I'll be covering more cards, I suspect, in the near future. And I hope to see you for those videos. Until then, take care.